How many realize Thanksgiving is just four days away? And that's something. And Christmas, all is right behind that. And I will share a lot of joy this time of year. It seems like most of us kind of get into Thanksgiving mode on November 1st. And we start thinking about Thanksgiving. And I'm looking forward to it. You know, Thanksgiving's a time to hang out with family. And uh, not to mention all the good food. I'm never against that as well. And I know this year uh, we're going to have a great family Thanksgiving. There's probably going to be up to 50 people. And Stan and Debbie are just so looking forward to uh, having 50 people in their house this year. They're just telling me how excited they were. They can't wait. But uh, originally I was going to say 35 or 40, but it's going to be more like 50. They're coming in from Kentucky and Illinois. And, and it's great to see family because, you know, a lot of times, you know, you only see some once a year, especially those from out, out of state. And others, even though we live right here in uh, Evansville, you know, months go by. You know, at Thanksgiving is the time we get to get together and talk and just enjoy some family time. Uh, uh, as Cheryl also said, we kind of get into a Thanksgiving mode uh, on, on November 1st. And how many have Facebook? Okay. I know a few of you don't. How many have Facebook? And, uh, uh, you know, most people do. Some choose not to, and that's, I understand the, the reasons for that as well. But, uh, I, I've seen on Facebook before where folks will write down something or comment about something they're thankful for every day throughout uh, November up until Thanksgiving, maybe beyond. You know, most importantly though, we want to remember to give God thanks. He's the one that really deserves our thanks. and uh, He deserves our praise for all the good things that go on in our lives. So, you know, don't ever let a time go by when something good happens that you don't give God thanks for. It. He deserves our thanks. And uh, I know God deserves my praise. God deserves my thanksgiving to Him. And I desire to give it to Him. I really do. I mean, nobody has to push me and you know twist my arm to praise God or to thank God. We used to, I'll praise God at the drop of a hat and I'll drop the hat. Amen? So, uh, you know, they say that about preaching too, and I guess that's kind of true as well. But, uh, but as we think about it, uh, it, we all want to do that. But beyond that, in the Scriptures, we see that God commands us to praise Him. God commands us to give Him thanks. Now, I don't know about you, but growing up, I was taught not to do something to get thanks. I was taught not to do things in order to be praised for it. You do it because you want to do it, because you desire to help somebody or whatever it might be, but you never did it for thanks. But in Scripture, I see time and again where God says, I want your praise. I want your thanksgiving. So I had to really give some thought to that. Now I realize there is a difference between God and me. Not a lot, but... <laughs> well, the one thing I do realize is that He's God and I'm not. Therefore, He deserves our praise. And it's okay for Him to ask for our praise, to ask for our thanksgiving, because He is God. He created us. So that's perfectly alright. However, I feel that it goes a little further than that. It goes beyond just Him deserving. So what might that be? Well, I discovered uh, reading the Scriptures, and I've discovered over the years that I can thank God in the good times. I can thank God on the mountaintop. But I can also thank God in the valley lows. Amen? Yes. Even in the down and out times, I can give God thanks. I can praise God even during those times. And I believe that's a sign of uh, uh, maturity in our Christian walk. When we're not just thankful during the good times, but we can be thankful even when we're down in the valley. Matter of fact, Scripture tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 and 18, it says, Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Now, that sounds like a pretty tall order. However, we need to understand God's not telling us to thank God for the valley. 
He tells us to give thanks while we're in the valley. In other words, we are, we are not told to give God thanks for the hard times. We're to give God thanks in the hard times, during the hard times. You know, we're not to thank God, oh, thank you, Lord, I got fired yesterday. Hallelujah, God. Thank you. Praise you. I lost my job. Although some believe that. I do not believe that's scriptural. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Amen. The thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come, Jesus said, that you might have life and that more abundant. You know, we're not to thank God when we have marital problems. Oh, thank you, God, that my wife and I, my husband and I, we're just not getting along nowadays. Thank you, Lord, for all this turmoil in our house. Thank you, Lord, that my kids started doing drugs. Hallelujah. See, it doesn't even make sense, does it? But yet, a lot of folks are teaching well, you're going to thank God for everything because He's got this plan. He's, he's working it all together and He wouldn't do this. His ways are higher than our ways. and Baloney. God is clearer than that. It does not make any sense. Yes, God will work in all things. That's why we're to thank Him in all things. It doesn't say thank Him for all things. In every circumstance, but it doesn't say to thank Him for every circumstance. It is telling us in the midst of a circumstance there is something to be thankful for. And be thankful even in the midst. Think of something that brings you joy. And thank God for that which brings you joy even in the midst of it. I heard a story the other day, maybe a couple weeks ago. But there was a young lady uh, that uh, was uh, in, in the Boston Marathon. And that bomb went off. And it it, it uh, messed up her leg, and uh, it, was, it was very damaged. And for several months, they were trying to restore that leg, trying to repair that leg. And, and uh, after several months of going through surgery after surgery and, and lots of pain, she finally made the decision to have her leg amputated. And I saw her on the news. And let me tell you something. This gal was full of joy. She was laughing. And, and, and had such a peace. Now let me ask you, do you think she was thankful that she was losing her leg? How many of you would truly be thankful that you lost your leg? No, that's not what she was thankful about. Her attitude was life is more than a leg. And that was her attitude. You see, she was not thankful that she lost her leg but she was thankful that after they took that leg off, there would be no more surgeries. After they took that leg off and it healed up, there would be no more pain. After they took her leg off, she could go ahead and get on with her life. She was thankful in the midst of all of this that was going on. But she wasn't thankful that she lost her leg. But yet she was thankful in the midst of that circumstance. And if she could be thankful and joyful and smiling and laughing in the midst of that terrible situation, how much more should we be thankful for the things that are in our life even though we're going through some things? In every situation in life, we can find something to be thankful about. There's also, I believe, a spiritual dynamic involved when we praise God and give thanksgiving. I believe our sadness is turned to joy. God tells us not to complain. You know God's really against complaining? I mean, just read the Scriptures. He hates it. He hates complaining. I know all of us are going, ouch! <laughs> Amen? Because we all tend to have a little problem in that area. At least most of us do. And you know, I'm not saying this to bring condemnation on anybody, but you know, we need to be challenged. Amen? Let's turn our complaining into rejoicing. We can choose to be thankful or we can choose to complain. We have to understand, church, that the reason God tells us to be thankful and praise is not just so that He can receive it, but it's He knows what's best for us. A lot of it is for our benefit as well. We have to understand that our attitude affects our bodies. Did you hear that? Our attitude affects our bodies. 
Church, that is science. That has been proven. But here, here's the thing. God knew it all along. God did not need science to come along and confirm what He knew already. You see, God has it down. God knows all things. You know, we thought we made a big discovery whenever we found out the earth wasn't flat. <laughs> God says way back in the Old Testament, the circle of the earth. Amen? You see, if we just look at the wisdom of God, uh, uh, you know, if science disagrees with the Bible, just wait long enough and they'll find out they're wrong. Amen? Now they call us idiots for not believing science over the Bible. Well, you just give it enough time. Because let God be true. And every man a liar. Amen? Hallelujah. In Proverbs 17.22 it reads, A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Just as laughter does good to the body, a negative or negative emotions harm the body. Stress and worry and fear have been known to cause ulcers, high blood pressure. They've been known to mess up bowel movements. We're just getting real, amen. It can cause skin problems. It can cause arthritis. Because you see what goes in the mind has to have a release somewhere. And that somewhere is through your body. In Proverbs 14.30, listen to what it says there. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Within our bodies, there is, uh, within our bones, there's marrow. And I looked this up on Wikipedia, so I hope it's right. But, from that marrow comes blood, red blood cells, and white blood cells. The red blood cells carry oxygen uh, to sustain life to the entire body, and white blood cells are primary, par primarily a defense mechanism in the immune system. And that's how all that works. So there's no doubt that there is connection between the mind and the body. There is a connection between the mind and the body. And there are also consequences, both positive and negative. God created our bodies to respond to our minds. Again, that's science. If you need some science to help your faith out and believe in that. Now, here's the thing though. God knows that our bodies respond to our minds, but then He tells us what to do with our minds. And God expected our minds to be conformed to His Word. So if our minds follow the Word of God, there's a good benefit to our body. Amen? <clears throat> when we get out of line with God's Word, that just messes everything up. But God expects us to follow His Word. He commands us to be thankful and praise because He knows that's going to have a positive effect. I mean, it's not the only reason. It's a byproduct. But He knows that that will cause a positive effect in our bodies. You see, we are called to be different from the world. I think a lot of Christians are forgetting that nowadays. We're called to be different from the world. It says that we are to be a peculiar people. Our attitude ought to be different. I, I just want to pat myself on the back for something I did yesterday. The biggest problem I've ever had is not road rage, necessarily, but it's when somebody gives me a gesture. Usually that makes me mad. And not too long ago, I think it was on Charity's wedding day, somebody did that, and I did nothing wrong. And so I just gun it, get right up on their tailgate. Then I pull up next to them, I just stare at them. Like, I dare you to get out of the car. And I said, you know, there's two things wrong with that. I lose either way. If they get out of the car and I beat them up, I lose. If if they get out of the car and I get out of the car, they beat me up, I lose. There's, there's a no-win situation there. So I'm glad it didn't go any further than a little stare. Well, yesterday was my trial, my test. <laughs> I get ready to pull out. I mean, I didn't do anything wrong. I was just kind of easing out a little bit. And this car, for some reason, I mean, he's like, you know, just throwing his hands up in the air. And he gives me a, a sign language. And, and Cheryl and I are in the car. And 
my, immediately I wanted to just, well, actually I did a little bit. I kind of pushed on the gas just a little bit, then I stopped. And then I smiled real big, and Cheryl smiled real big, and we just waved. <laughs> Yep. Then he's like, rrr, 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 he, just, he was shaking. So, I said, you know, I'm too old for that stuff anyway. You see, that's just the old nature. Not that I had that anymore, but I still got to renew my mind a little bit. Amen? And I mean, back when I was a teenager, that's what you did. Somebody challenged you, you jumped out of the car, and you said, come on. You see, but I'm an old man now. I'm a pastor. I'm a Christian. I had no business even thinking that way. So I made it a point from now on. If anybody does it, I'm going to smile real big. Wave at I love you anyway, brother. Amen? And I believe I can do that. So, we're not expected to act like the world. Amen? We're to have a different attitude. Hallelujah. It says in Romans 12, 2, And do not be conformed to this world. See, that's the way the world acts. We're not to act that way. It says, but be transformed. Hallelujah. How do we do that? How are we transformed? It says, by the renewing of your mind. And church, that's why we need to get in the Word of God. That's why we need to spend time with God. It's not so that you can just sit down and read your three chapters, put a check mark by it, and say, I've done my duty for the day. No, it's because you want to be transformed. You want to be conformed into His image. And how you do that is by reading the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God, and spending time in the presence of God. That's how you're transformed. You see, this world is under the control of the devil. You know, everybody wants to try to blame everything that happens on God. God's, God's not even... In, okay, this is really going to ruffle some of your feathers. But God is not in control. There I said it. Why is God not in control? Because He chooses not to be in control because He gave us a free will, Tom. And if He gives us a free will, we cannot have a free will and Him controlling our will at the same time. We choose. And because of those choices, sometimes are bad, it has consequences. I know that just busts this... Bust every, you know, oh, God's in control. God's, yeah, God is on the throne. But God is not in control. God's not controlling all the situations that are going on. If, if your daughter gets raped, God's not in control of that. The devil's the God of this world. The devil's the one causing all the evil to take place. Now, can God use that and make, make good out of it? Yes, He can. You see, I remember Cheryl talked to a lady, this has been years and years ago, was molested as a child all of her life. And she's like, well, God allowed that to happen so that I can minister to young ladies today. Now, God can't make good out of a bad situation. And He does many times. But can you imagine God just saying, okay, uh, and by allow, they mean actively allow. I mean, that would be like, okay, well, I didn't do it, but I allowed so-and-so to rape that little girl. Does that make me any better? No. And a lot of people go around blaming God for things like that that have happened in their life when God didn't have anything to do with it except to try to bring comfort when you needed comfort. And why did God stop it? Because we're not in heaven yet. We live in a sin-filled world and bad things happen to good people. It breaks God's heart more than anybody, but God is not in control of it. God did not make it happen. And God did not allow it to happen in the way that He wanted, wanted it to happen. Forgive me for being a little bit passionate about that. But I get so tired of hearing God blame for things like that. Give thanks unto God for all things unto God. All things that God is responsible for. Not all things. This world is under the control, under the sway of the devil. It says the whole world lies in the lap of the wicked one. That's this world's system. It's of the devil. His aim is to kill, steal, kill, and destroy. Church, if it has to do with stealing, killing, and destroying, I'll tell you who the author of that is. The devil. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that more abundant. 
And we can, we can wrap up all this evil in the prettiest package you want. It's still not God. You can make it sound as religious as you want, but it's still not God. That's not who God is. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The church, even in the midst of that, we can still be thankful. Not that we're going through it, but we can be thankful because there's something we can be thankful for, even in the midst of whatever may be going on. Amen? You know, if you can't think of anything else to be thankful for, and how many have been there? You just can't think of anything to be thankful for. And we all hit those places sometimes. It, it's, it, sometimes it's just hard to even think of anything. Everything seems to be falling in around us. Everything is going wrong. I tell you, church, you can still be thankful that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm going to heaven. Someday this will be over. Now, you don't have to wait until you die for it to be over. Amen? But if that's where you are, at least you can think someday... As a matter of fact, in Romans 8, 18, listen to what it says. Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. If you think you suffered, think about what Paul went through. How many of you have been beaten and left for dead? Very few of us. But Paul said that. I reckon that the suffering, all that I've gone through, and you go read what he went through. He's all this is not even compared worthy of the glory that shall be revealed in me. Choose to look at life from an eternal perspective. That can change a lot of things, amen. It allows you to live in thankfulness and experience joy in spite of the persecution. I think of the disciples the apostles, how they were persecuted, they were beaten, they were put into prison. And what do you see them do? You see them worshiping God. You see them praising God. Lord, I thank you that I'm considered worthy to suffer for you. When's the last time we've done that? Church, there's Christians all over this world that are facing persecution daily. We don't have a clue here in America. And I'll tell you, they're probably some of the most joy-filled people that you'll ever see. Even though they're in the midst of terrible persecution. Now, let me just say this. I'm not suggesting that you ignore or deny your pain. You do not have to come into church every Sunday with a smile on your face. I have no problems. Everything is perfect. I'm not suggesting that at all. As a matter of fact, we're told to bear one another's burdens. Amen? Actually, more correctly, we're to help each other carry our burdens to the Lord. Cast all your care upon the Lord, for He cares for you. And sometimes we just need a little help, because that load's a little heavy. Amen? No, we're simply to look for the things that we can be thankful for rather than looking at the things to complain about. Again, if you're in a season of despair, start singing, Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me Thy great salvation, so rich and free. Amen. Meditate on what He did for you that you get to spend eternity in heaven with Him. I tell you, that can put a smile on your face no matter what you're going through. Also realize this. It's a season. And seasons change. It won't always be this way. See, that's why we're in this together. Amen. Amen. That's what church family is about. It says, be happy, in Romans 12, 15, it says, be happy with those who are happy and weep with those that weep. In other words, when somebody's going through a difficult time, 
You can cry with them. You can pray with them. Then you can say, now let's take it to the Lord. Now let's take it to the Lord. Now let's just start believing God for the great things He has planned for you. You see, even though we might be in that place, we're not to stay in that place. If we're honest, every day is not going to be a shout, glory shouting day. But we can still have peace. We can still have joy. Amen? In Psalms 30, verse 5, it says, Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Church, there, there are different seasons. Have you ever noticed that in your life? There are different seasons. You may be on the mountaintop. <coughs> well, you need to weep with those that are not right now. And there may come a day in the near future where they're on the mountaintop. And they need to weep with you. But also remember this, even though you're in the valley, you need to rejoice with those that are on the mountaintop. Amen? That's why we're in this together. I challenge you to change your perspective. Look at the positive rather than the negative. Amen? Stir up the hope that is within you and release your faith in God. Because with God, all things are possible. Amen? And don't forget it. And put your joy in that, that this too came to pass. It's one of my favorite verses of Scripture. And it came to pass. It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. Amen? And realize, whatever you're going through, through prayer, through meditating on His goodness, you'll come out of it. You'll come out on the other side. I think about when the disciples went off into the storm. They had a promise to hold on to, didn't they? He said, meet me on the other side. And if you know Jesus wants to meet you on the other side, He's going to be there. Amen? And His presence will be with you throughout the whole trip. But realize there is another side. And I realize that in this holiday season, sometimes we've lost loved ones. And there's so many things and, you know, that, that can try to bring us down. But, you know, we can rejoice. If we know they went to be with the Lord. We don't have to be sad for them, do we? We can rejoice that they are experiencing the wonders of heaven. And we will be re reunited with them one day. Amen? Sometimes this season... Gets the best of all of us. Uh, the change in weather and the, all that, you know, kind of, it's just not as cheery, is it? But spring's coming. Amen. <laughs> and your spring spiritually is coming. And your spring emotionally is coming. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Matter of fact, it says keep your eyes fixed on the altar and finisher of our salvation. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we again just give You all the praise and all the glory for all the good things that You have done in our life. And Lord, we, we are thankful that You are with us when things aren't going so great. We thank You, Lord, for Your promises. Lord, we just stand upon Your promises. And, and, and Lord, even as the uh, old hymn says, we, we count our blessings one by one. And we just thank You, Lord, for... Uh, watching out for us. We thank You, Lord, that every good and perfect gift comes from You. And Lord, we thank You this morning for everything, Lord, that, that good that You have done in our lives. And Father, I pray for these people present this morning. Lord, I pray that You would just minister to each and every heart. I pray, God, that You would remind them of the joy that is set before them. I thank You, Lord, for uh, just... Uh, uh, ministry by Your Holy Spirit. I'll just ask everybody if you would just lift your hands toward the Lord this morning. Just, just as a sign of thanksgiving this morning. And I want you to just begin to thank Him. Just You can do it verbally or you can do it from your heart. Just however you feel led. But Just begin to thank Him this morning. He deserves our, our thanks. Hallelujah. Glory to your holy name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, we just thank you for all the wonderful things that you've done in our lives. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to die upon the cross. 
We thank you, Lord, for being who you are. We thank you that you stand by your word and your promises. All your promises are yes and amen. Lord, we just thank you that, that you can turn the darkness into light, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Give us eyes of faith, God, to see beyond that which the enemy would put in front of us, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remove the blinders, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. We magnify you. Lord, you are awesome in this place. Hallelujah. Be glorified. We exalt your name together. Hallelujah. Just begin to thank Him, church. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to ask you to do something. I don't know if we've ever done this before, but to continue in an attitude of prayer, just put your hand on someone's shoulder next to you. And just begin to pray for that person. You know, you never know what someone's going through. They may have a smile on their face, but they may be in the midst of a storm. And just begin to pray God's peace upon them right now. Hallelujah. Pray for the joy to just break forth in their spirit. Hallelujah. Pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit to be manifested right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. You're such a good God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We worship Jesus. We praise you. Hallelujah. 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 Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody look up at me, please. <coughs> want us to close by audibly giving our thanks to Him by just putting your hands together. God's awesome. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we